So with that, I'll pass over to Rory. Thanks, Borig, and uh, thank you, Angel, as well, for um, uh, for coming here. Um, these conversations in the IAEA are always an important moment, but I think today's one is, is particularly interesting because it brings together different strands of relationships, discussions that sometimes happen in different silos. And I think it's fantastic that Angel uh, Losada has come to, 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 to give us that opportunity, you know, where where a conversation where we can bring together development, humanitarian response, security, proximity, migration, and many other themes, including, I think, climate and other, other elements that are also part of the, the melange of issues which the Sahel is struggling to deal with. And I think that we collectively, as EU member states, are also struggling to respond to. Um, it's fantastic that we have uh, a diplomat of, of the calibre of Ángel Osada Fernández as the EU Special Representative uh, for the Sahel. And, you know, when, I say, when we say the EU Special Representative, that's a sort of a distancing already. You know, he's our Special Representative. Uh, he mightn't quite have his Irish accent perfected yet. <laughs> but by the end of these couple of days, uh, he'll have learned a few words like grand and a, uh, and, and a few things like that. You know, and Ankel has been doing this job for a while, so I think you know we'll, we'll learn a lot in, in, in from what he says. You know, he's he you know he's been effectively a special representative for the Sahel since 2015, because before the EU appointed him, he was Spain's representative, um, and he 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 brought to the task as well the experience of having been the Spanish ambassador in Kuwait, Nigeria, and Kabul. So he doesn't like easy cities, so we probably won't stay here with us for too long. Um, we can do hardship here too, if you want. You know, this is... This, um, we'll bring you to a few places. We'll bring you to a few, few places on the way to the airport. Um, you know, and, and ju just to prove that this is a theme that, that he, he really understands, you know, Ankle has also worked for the Spanish Foreign Ministry in Cuba with NATO, which must have been a real hardship post, you know. Uh, the UN in Geneva, which I think was probably or and or, uh, in Chile, and, and he started his career uh, abroad uh, in Ethiopia. And in between, he had to go and live in Madrid, which you know I think we all, you have our sympathies for that. <laughs> um, the Sahel is, is is it's a funny place if you're an Irish diplomat because we're not properly present there, notwithstanding the government's commitment as manifest by by you know, the presence of, of, of soldiers there, part, first of all, as part of the EU training mission, but also now as part of MINUSMA. And that's something that I think, as, as, a, as a foreign ministry, uh, we're very conscious of, uh, and, and we know we need to respond. Uh, we do put money in um, uh, as part of the, the collective response, and, and some of that money goes to support the work of, of very fine Irish NGOs across the, the G5 Sahel and across the whole Sahel, which of course goes from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. And, um, and it's an interesting, troubled, challenging and, and brilliant region. And, you know, certainly in terms of the Francophone piece, we don't have a great story. I think in the Anglophone piece, we've been in, 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 in the Sahel for a very long time. And uh, I know people in this room cut their teeth in, the, in various Sudans, um, probably lost a few teeth in the various Sudans as well. Uh, you know, in, in Eritrea, but we have to do better in in Francophone Africa, and we're very conscious of that, uh, and we're grateful too for the Irish NGOs that are there. And why do we have to do better? I think partly it's because in, in, in our white paper that we did earlier this year, and thank you to those who, who, who gave, gave us a really good uh, participation in that, you know, we recognize that the interconnection of the world and our place within that we recognise that we have to deal with those furthest behind first. And I think, you know, we've been evolving a language around global citizenry as well. Um, and I'm, I think also increasingly conscious that of proximity. The world is a smaller place than it used to be. And it's not far by sea from here to Senegal. Uh, it's not far from North Africa to the southern parts of Europe as well. And so we are interconnected. And this is a century where if we don't recognize properly those interconnections between Europe and Africa, the possibility that Africa has to leapfrog forward, 
will be missed. There's, there's a, a writer that I found when I was thinking about today called T.K. Nalaka. Nalaka. I know nothing about him, but he has a good quote, uh, which I think is a, a nice way to, to end, which is, he said, quote, when any country in the Sahel sle sneezes, the rest of the region catches pneumonia. The men there would have clicked their tongues and ruefully nodded their heads that Wulaya, I don't know what that means, but maybe you can tell us, uh, this was the truth. And I think it's that, you know, that sense of when, when, when somewhere else that's not that far away is in danger, we have to respond, partly because it's the good thing to do as humans, but also because it's in our selfish interest. And, and that's why it's important that we, we support uh, our special representative for the Sahel, but it's also really important that we hear from you so we understand what that support should be and we understand the challenges uh, that you're trying to address on our behalf. So I'm looking forward greatly to hearing what you have to have to say to us, Angel. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Rory, for these words. Thank you, the Institute, also uh, for inviting me. I'm, I feel very honored to be here, really, today. And I like the name of the Institute, which is International and European Affairs. That's, I think it's, uh, it shows how uh, Europe is in your heart and how Europe uh, can be our house for, uh, for all of us, our home for, for all of us. Um, thank you for also, in this very prestigious place, to give me the opportunity to talk about the Sahel, that I know I'm talking to academics. Some of you are very knowledgeable about the situation, and I'm, I have no doubt that many of the things I would say, you know them already. But uh, the good thing of the Sahel also, the important thing of the Sahel, that is there is a constant evolution of the, in, in, the, in the Sahel. Actually, as EU, EU Special Representative, which is uh, uh, recorded and taken in the, in the Lisbon Treaty, in the Article 33, my mission mainly is to try to coordinate and to give a coherent approach of the EU to the Sahel in concrete and the others representative to the task or the mandate that they have on a specific subject. It's not easy because the EU also has its different positions. Then we have the Parliament, as you know, we have the Council, we have the EAS, we have the Commission, but uh, what's important, and we have the Member States, which are the, without the Member States we won't have the EU, of course. Then the important thing is just to try to have a coherent approach, and that's mainly the task of the EU Special Representative. I would like, to, as I'm talking to academics, etc., I would like to talk about four different aspects or four different, four different points. Because we are now at a critical moment. It comes very, it's a real good opportunity as a critical moment where one of the heart of my mandate, which is the peace process in Mali, is as a sort of blockage at that moment. And when, on the other hand, we have this G5, which is taking more importance, but with a lot of limitations, as we're going to see. Then I would like first, and as I'm talking to academics, to divide in four parts my intervention. The first one, and I think it's important, what is the Sahel? Because when there are different uh, concepts of Sahel. The second, the second one is what the EU is doing for the Sahel. The third one, I will talk about the new initiatives which are taking place today. And finally, I will s talk about the principles and the challenges uh, that we have ahead of us and that we have to confront in order to have a proper and well-coordinated coordinate action. Then the first big question is the concept of Sahel. It's not only an academic question. It goes, it goes beyond, beyond that with no, with no doubt. And I've developed a theory, which you can find some other. I distinguish three different Sahels, a geographic one, a what I call an institutional one, and a third one which I call a geostrategical one. First, you know that the word Sahel in Arab means uh, border, means uh, the border, the, the, the limitation between one other. Yes, it's the limitation between the Saharan African and the green Africa, so to say, or the sub-Saharan Africa. Is this, is this French, uh, is, it's, is this uh, element which is important to know is a limitation. There is a change between one part and the other. But then let's start with the first one, the geographical, the geographical definition. It's very easy to say, and you can understand it very easily. It's this strip of land which is more or less 5,400 kilometers long from the Atlantic Sea to the Red Sea, and more or less uh, 700 
500 kilometers large uh, in, all, in, all, in, all these, in all these area. This goes through 11 countries, 11 countries which have more or less the same, the same uh, characteristic and uh, we have from the geographical point of view exactly the same, uh, the, the same elements. And it's very easy from the geographical point of view, the Sahel is very easy to understand. The second one or the second concept which I've called the institutional one is a bit different. First, why institutional? I invented this name because there is an institution. You know, all know about it, but it's not so well known in the public. It's the famous, it's the famous, G, it's the famous G5. The G5, which is composed <clears throat> by Mauritania, by Mali, by Burkina Faso, by Niger, and by Chad, has been created by a sovereign decision of five heads of states the five heads of state at that time, who decided to create an organization because they thought that they have the same problem. And the first element, which I want to say, they realized that the, the big problems or the big threats that they were facing were regional. Then if the threats are regional, the answer must be regional. That's why the G5, sta the G5 started by this proper will of these five, of these five heads of state. And they created an organization uh, which a very simple structure, a presidency, which is rotative. There are, uh, now mm, the presidency is taken by Burkina Faso. It will be taken very soon in February by Mauritania. Uh, they have a permanent secretariat with headquarters in Nouakchott with a very simple structure, uh, a permanent secretary and if you visited the, the place, uh, it's not really the big organization as you have been probably some of you in Addis Ababa in the AU, which is even more, more impressive than the UN. The, the building of the AU is more impressive almost than the UN. Well, no, in, uh, the, if you go to the G5, you wouldn't find, you wouldn't find that. It's a very simple structure with, uh, with little means. And actually, the European countries who wanted to help this uh, the G5 with, from the beginning, and that's one of the first contradictions that we have. We said we don't want to create a big structure to help you to create a big structure. Uh, we want something very simple that you can manage. The problem now is that they've taken more and more capacity, and with this little structure that we've imposed more or less to them, there are some doubts that they're capable of facing really uh, the situation, uh, the, what we ask them to do, what we ask them to do. Well, we'll, come, we'll come to that a bit, a bit later. But this organization, with these simple structures, as I said, now uh, the permanent secretariat is, is, is headed by, um, by Maman Sidiku, who is from Niger, a very, very well-known person in Africa, and um, actually studied in Spain. I have somebody from Spain, he studied in Spain, and is, uh, is also, is so also, is also well-formed. I speak with him in Spanish, usually. usually, usually. We have then uh, this very simple structure, which is based on two elements, on two actions mainly, security and development. For in the security side, they decided to create a joint force. I was present when they decided to create this joint force. Uh, it was in Jamena for the, in, in, the, in November 2015, when they say, I was on, at that moment with my Spanish hat actually, some days before I started, uh, as a youth, they decided the five heads of state went on the on a sp specific room, came out and said, we're going to create a joint force. We all said, all of us, all of us at that time, how are they going to create a joint force, the five poorest countries in the world? Is that possible? How are they going to manage to do that? It's something that we cannot Im imagine. We almost laugh at it. But at that moment, one person, and I think we must recognize that, uh, and I wasn't in the EU at that moment, Federica Mogherini came out when this was announced and said, the EU is going to support this joint force with 50 million. It was an impact, it created an impact. Of course, the joint force had to wait almost one year, more than one year, until they really decided to adopt the concept of operation and to adopt all the different instruments later. That was in February 2000, 2017. But they want to create the joint force. And they come with a second idea. Not only security, but also in development. We want a Marshall Plan for Africa and for the Sahel, for our organization, with some difficulties and some very uh, doubtful uh, proposals, for instance, to create uh, Sahel Airways, 
that we sell, well, I mean, sell, or a fast train from Nuachok to Jamena, I mean, uh, but they wanted really to create an infrastructure, to have a lot of infrastructure, and with a Marshall Plan, and they will ask member states from the Europe, from, from the Western world to finance, to finance, to finance that. And that, and therefore we have the, uh, the, the G5, and we'll talk again after about the G5 and what it, and what, uh, and what it, in, and what it entails. But the G5, little by little, although at the beginning, had a lot of difficulties to, to come out because they had a lot of enemies. Uh, some organization didn't like it in Africa because they thought it will retain some of the help from the Western country will go to them. And some other, for security reasons, were not either very comfortable with this idea uh, because they thought that they would lose some influence. For instance, uh, Algeria at the beginning, which is a main player in the, in the region, uh, and I work very closely to them, has never liked from the beginning the G5. Now, yes, now there is an adaptation from the moment that the UN has been really uh, considering it as a proper organization, and it comes now in all the resolutions, and there is always a talk in the Security Council about the G5, about the future and this structuring system. Then that's the second concept of the Sahel. Is the con concept, the, what I call the institutional one, because of this institution, these five countries uh, which compose the Sahel. But you will tell me the Sahel is more than that. There's not only five countries. And that's why I built this idea to talk about the geostrategical concept of the Sahel. The geostrategical concept take into account all the countries which have an impact and influence on the Sahel, the crisis, and the organizations. And I've divided in three circles. The first circle, of course, are the five countries of the G5 themselves. This is the main aspect, the really the, the, the most important one. The second one, the crisis. Which crises have an impact today on the, have or and still have on the Sahel? The Libyan crisis? You cannot understand what happened in Mali if you don't take into consideration what happened in Libya. Uh, and actually, uh, the Libyan crisis really uh, allows, in Mali mainly, that the Tuareg uh, rebellion was a success at the beginning. Because in Niger, on the other hand, the Niger, uh, Niger authorities uh, stopped uh, the Tuaregs take their arms away, but this wasn't done in Mali. That was one of the main problems. Then we have two crises, mainly. The Libyan one, and also the Nigerian one, the Nigerian created by Boko Haram. That's why now there is this idea in the United Nations, in the EU also, to assimilate more and more Sahel and Lak Chad Basin. You know that to face the crisis in Lak Chad Basin, the, they create the Joint Task Force uh, the Multinational Joint Task Force, MNGTF, uh, to fight, composed by four countries, the three countries around the Lake, Lake Chad, uh, the four, sorry, um, Cam Cameroon, Cameroon, Chad, uh, Niger, and Nigeria, plus Benin, which will participate on security questions uh, with them. Four, these, these, these countries have created an army, a joint army, which works more or less to fight Boko Haram, and they had, they had some success. Uh, the, Libya, the, the Boko Haram crisis is now closely linked to the crisis in the Sahel. And we know by intelligence information that some, in some of the camps of uh, terrorist camp for training, uh, groups of Boko Haram have been working on Malian soil and vice versa. And we, know, we know that uh, by information. Then there is a link, there is an international, again, we talk about the regionalization, and we'll talk later of the EU, there is also a regionalization of the terrorist actors in the, in the ground. This is, I said, the second, the second circle, these two big crises which had a direct impact on the, on the Sahel. And there is also, what I said, the, the countries or organization. Countries which compose these third circles, Algeria, I said, I said it before, Algeria is a fundamental actor. Algeria, uh, I have constant talks either with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Algeria or with the authorities in Algeria. They are fundamental, but today Algeria is under a big internal problem, as we all know, and that's why the situation may be as, mm, as a problem to, to, ev to evolve. Algeria is with no doubt one. Uh, Nigeria, again, talking about Boko Haram, is also a fundamental one. And Senegal, Senegal by itself, geographically speaking, 
is a Sahelian uh, country, but they are not included in the G5. They were not very happy with this idea. They thought that the G5 at the beginning was against them, but uh, we had this argument to tell them, and I had this argument even to, to expose to them. Actually, the five countries that we're talking are weak in their institution, weak in the governance, poor, without any problem of prospect, uh, with a lot of problem to, 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 to progress. Senegal, when I talked to them, Senegal, one of the only countries in Africa who never had a coup d'etat, a strong institution, developing very quickly, they have nothing to do with them. It's better that these five countries stick together and all the rest participate in this third circle. Then Senegal, of course, uh, is another one. And now a new actor which wants to be more and more active and is Morocco. Of course, because his brother, Algeria, is very much involved. Morocco wants to be involved. And, and uh, the problem between Morocco and Algeria, is well known by all of you, uh, make more difficult sometimes to have a proper action in the, in, in, to have a proper action in the, in the region. Nevertheless, uh, the Maghreb dimension, which is present in the Maghreb, must not be for, must not been forgotten, and we have to work very closely also with the Moroccans. We are more and more present in the region through banking system, through the economy, and also the influence himself of the King of Morocco over this region by, for centuries. Then I think with this element we see the countries, but they are not only countries which are in, which participate in the Sahel. There are also organizations in this third circle, and we have, of course, the African Union. The African Union has a special, a high representative uh, in, uh, in in Mali for the peace process, which is former president of Burundi, uh, Buyoya. Buyoya. Uh, the the U African Union is very active. In all, these, in all the elements in the Sahel and wants to be very active, although there's been at the there was at the beginning a sort of uh, reticence, so to say, uh, with the creation of the G5 because they didn't like it either. They would prefer to use their own security instrument, but they realized that these five countries now is better to have them together in order that they can play together. There is ECOWAS, on the same, the same problem that um, what happened before with, uh, with, uh, with the AU, they were not too happy with the creation of the, of the G5, but nevertheless, now there's been a new uh, evolution, which I will talk later, which makes that they try to collaborate and cooperate very, very closely, and that's what us, as European uh, and as EU, we are, we are, we are, pushing, we are, pushing, we are pushing forward. And of course, the EU, although out of the region, is also an important actor with the UN. This is, I think, I wanted to, I wanted to see these three kinds of concepts which help us a little bit. Well, my mandate, actually, the mandate approved by member states uh, is the third mandate, is this third, this geostrategical one. <coughs> because it's, it makes me uh, participate not only in the five countries, but all the surrounding countries in the Maghreb and with the international, with the international organizations. Uh, and also with the Black Chat Basin, which is strategically linked to the other one. Having seen that, <coughs> I would like to now to define not only the, this geographical, institutional, and geostrategical world, but what, can, what are the main challenges that this region is facing. I always say that, unfortunately, the Sahel is a polygon of crisis. We find there all the crises that we want. Sorry. All the crises that we want. We have a security crisis. We have a political crisis. We have an economic and development crisis. And all the elements can. And I will go quick, quickly through them very, very, very quickly. Above all, we'll talk about the security one. Yes, there is a radicalization in the zone, and now we are facing a terrible situation, <coughs> excuse me, um, a terrible situation in which the insecurity is growing at a very fast speed, very fast, unfortunately. We have the insecurity which started in the Mali. To understand the situation, we have to start from the Mali, from, from the Malian crisis, which started in Mali, 
which is now more or less channel, and I can answer many questions on the peace process in Mali, as I'm the mediator on behalf of the EU in the, in the peace process, but it's the heart and the beginning of everything uh, in the Sahel today, of this insecurity. It started there in the north, now it's more or less channel, although the process is a bit blocked. Uh, we hope that we'll overcome the situation. It went down to the south, and the jihadist groups have been clever enough to mutate the threat, which at the beginning was a pure threat, uh, jihadist against the rest of the world, so to say, to take advantage of ancestral confrontations or clashes between farmers and herders, which are traditional in the, in the region, between different community groups. I don't like to talk ethnic groups, because they're all so mixed together that to talk ethnic groups would be maybe a mistake. But yes, community groups, it's better to say inter-community clashes, taking advantage of these clashes to create chaos among them and to take advantage of this situation. And this insecurity has gone down from the north to the center of Mali, to the south of Mali, to the part of Burkina Faso, going down to Burkina Faso, and even affecting now some of the Western countries, of some of countries of Western Africa, as Togo, as Benin, as even Ghana, in the northern part of, of Ghana. Then we see that there is this terrible danger, which unfortunately can affect a lot of this of, of this of the uh, of this country and that's why the situation now is evolving very it's evolving very very quickly then we have this security challenge which is there and uh, it's, it becomes more and more obvious and with a big need to act but we have also a political a political challenge uh, a political challenge because there is as i said at the beginning a lack of governance problem of governance, problem of corruption in this country. They are weak countries with very weak institutions. And we are, on top of that, in the political side, with a peace process. I know that this word is very important also in, in Ireland. <laughs> with a peace process in, in Mali, which is, which is um, as I said before, unfortunately blocked. It's blocked because of the opposition uh, of some of the of the movement, of the armed movement and the government uh, to, to go ahead with the implementation, with the quick implementation of the, of the agreement of Algiers, which was approved, you know, and ratified by all the parts of the agreement and also by the international community and among them by the European, by the European Union. It was, uh, this agreement must be absolutely implemented and in all the talks, all the uh, intervention, for instance, of Federica Mogherini, of all the members of the international community, we urge always the, uh, the, the, the different parts, the three parts we have signed the agreement, which is the government, La Plateforme, and the, in La SEMA, La, La Coordination, the three parts, these two movements uh, were uh, fighting together, now they are at least around the table, to, to really implement the agreement. Uh, I can ask question, I can answer to question about the agreement. I can talk hours about the agreement. Also, Frederic here has been followed that from the very, very from the very beginning. But this is a bit of the key question to have a solution. I always say the same sentence: We won't have peace in the Sahel if there is no peace in Mali, because the, the agreement is essential to the balance, to a proper balance on in the in the in the in the security sector. Uh, when they try me to define how we stand, I say there was a blockage. I always say also the same phrase. We don't go as fast as we hope, but not as slowly as we feared. And that's with that, more or less, in a diplomatic way, we solve everything because there is no other way than to progress and to accept, this, to accept this, uh, that the peace process go, goes, goes, goes ahead. There is, as I said, le comité de suite de l'accord, this foreign committee, which now is not meeting, I attend once a month with my with my colleague uh, Fre uh, Frédéric Mathieu. Uh, we attend once a month there, and on behalf of the EU, I try always to push all the elements of this agreement. Let's do hope that we'll have one meeting as soon as possible, because it's compulsory by the agreement itself, which has been recorded by the UN, to have one meeting of this committee of Suivi, this following committee of the agreement once a month. Let's see what is gonna happen, because one another idea which must be very clear, there is no plan B 
And that's a message that we give to the parts. There is no plan B to the agreement. The agreement was, signed, was uh, negotiated in Algeria, was signed uh, in two steps then in, uh, in, in Mali, and the international community, the inter international community really uh, support this agreement. But that's the political, that's another problem in the political aspect. But I said also, is it was, uh, it was uh, the, the situation in the Sahel. Uh, we found we found that all the crisis. There is also a very deep and terrible economic crisis, a crisis of development. If you imagine that in the Sahel, in the sub-Saharan Africa, sorry, the rent, uh, the income per capita is more or less one thousand four hundred uh, dollars. The countries in the Sahel, the only one who reaches this average, more or less, is Mauritania with 1,100. And then we go to a country like Niger, who doesn't reach the 400 euros, 400 dollars. I think I heard today the figure, and I was very impressed, that here in Ireland, you are over 70,000 of income per uh, rent per, per person. It's something very, very impressive. Uh, I mean, you see, you, you see the, that's what I've heard today at least. <laughs> but anyway, uh, more than, more, uh, in, in, in Europe, all the countries are above 30, 35,000. Uh, that's the, in Spain, is, I think 36,000. Uh, all are above, above, the, above, this, above this figure. When we talk of 400 euros, you imagine the level, the level of poverty that there is in a country like Niger is one. I always say I have five clients, which are these five countries of the G5, and unfortunately they are the five poorest countries in the world. But these are my clients, and I have to support, and we have all to support them. Then there is a problem, of course, of development, and I won't go on too much because you are very clear. Another big element and which helps us to understand what's happening in the Sahel is the demographic explosion. There is a proper demographic exp explosion. A country like Niger, for instance, a woman has an average of more than 7.4 7 children per woman. That shows that if a woman has not children, the other one has to have at least 14 or 15. You imagine the incredible push that this, this can have and the impact that in 20 or 30 years this can have for Europe. That's why, again, I say the security of the Sahel is the security of Europe because this is happening in front of our eyes at a very quick speed. And I will talk about that with radicalization also. There is another problem linked to this one very closely, climatic change. It's very obvious if you go to the, if you go to the, uh, to the Lake Chad. I know that some people say that it's cyclic, the Lake Chad has been bigger, it's smaller, but you see very properly the diminution of the Lake Chad, which is 10% of what it was less than 60 years ago. It's been very quick. It's true now that apparently it's refilling a little bit. But nevertheless, this has created that there's less land, less, more people, then more fight against herders, against farmers. There are more confrontation because of the climatic change. And there's one place in the Sahel, and I wouldn't talk about the Lake Chad, in the rest, in the area of, of the Lipta Kogurma, uh, in the place of the three borders between Niger, uh, Chad, Niger, Burkina, and Mali, in this area, the climatic change has a real strong impact because they're less land, and they're fighting for the lands. They're fighting for they heard they are fighting for for the for the, for the to till the land that doesn't exist any, that doesn't exist anymore. This of of course makes another crisis, and uh, which I know uh, is very popular to talk about it, is the migration one. Of course, uh, this demographic explosion, the less land, less opportunity, less uh, a, a poor situation of this country makes that they want to migrate. Young people want to migrate. And there is an incredible uh, strength of, uh, of young people who want to go absolutely out because they don't feel that where they are, they have any opportunities uh, ahead, ahead, uh, ahead, uh, ahead of them. These are more or less the characteristic of the Sahel, broadly, sp broadly speaking, with these three concepts and the main characteristic that, th that they have. Well, you say that, that's very well. Uh, this is what we have ahead, but uh, Ireland contribute very heavily to the EU, etc. What is the EU doing? What are we doing? Are we doing something to face that? Well, we must accept that the EU, in this aspect, 
of saw what is going to happen, and it was the first one in 2011 to adopt a strategy. A strategy which is very simple. It is based on one principle, no security without development, no development without security. Today now, this is widely accepted, but as I said before, I was in Afghanistan, uh, and there was a big difficulty to that military work with NGOs. There were big difficulties to accept this concept because everyone wanted to be a, a, on the side. Nowadays, we realize that mainly in the Sahel, maybe in other parts we can discuss about it, but mainly in the Sahel, as insecurity as it says, has grown up to big proportion, uh, there cannot be development without security. No NGOs are going to go to places where, where the life at a sta are at stake then, therefore, there is no other way that, uh, to link both of them. And the EU strategy is acts towards five countries. You will not be surprised if you realize that the five countries of the strategy are the countries of the G5. They are the five countries which, are, which received, actually, we are, received this strategy. But the strategy has been complemented by the integrated approach of the EU, which take in consideration not only security, development, but also political uh, question, humanitarian, humanitarian one, and all the crises that I've described. This is the integrated approach of the EU to tackle the problem of, of, the, of the Sahel. Well, it's very well to have a strategy, it's very well to have five countries to address to, but now we need something else. We need some action, and yes, there is, there is a regional action plan, a regional action plan which was adopted in, uh, in 2015, and which will be uh, finishing in 2020, and will start, try to delimitate where were the main actions that the EU had to do with the participation of member states. The importance of this regional action plan was not only that it established the priorities, but also that uh, the regional action plan did, uh, it, it tried it try in, it tried to, est to establish which responsibilities were for each, for, for each, for each one. That was, uh, that was the, what tried to do the regional action plan. We established four priorities. The first one, you would understand, is youth. For the problem I said before, I don't want to go on too much on uh, that. The second one is preventing radicalization. And this is a very important one. And there are many programs to prevent radicalization. The third one is migration. We couldn't have that without migration. And that's why the EU convened a meeting in La Valletta in which they approved a fund, a special fund, for adopting on a quick manner, in a quick manner, programs to tackle the root causes of migration. But when we say root causes of migration, all we say is everything. Which are the root causes of migration? Security, uh, poverty, education, uh, uh, development. It's almost everything, but uh, formation of youth, uh, schooling, etc. Uh, in order that, in order to prevent uh, or to stop these young people to go outside of Africa and to try to find in their own place what, the, what, the, what, the, what they need. This is the third priority. And the fourth priority is related, of course, to security, to border control, and, uh, to tr and, to, uh, and the fight against traffics, which actually is something which is very difficult to do. Because if you look at the Sahel, you go through, back through history in the Sahel, it's an area of traffics. It has always been like that. I've been talking, for instance, in, uh, in Agadez, which is one of the cities uh, in the middle of Niger, which received all the migration from the Horn of Africa and all the migration from Western Africa who joined there and go up to Libya. I've been talking to a man who said, well, I'm a driver. Before I was driving tourists, because it's an impressive area. I mean, if you've ever been to the Sahara and to this area, it's, it's really impressive. It's, I find it really, really beautiful, but there were a lot of tourists. There was a flight between Marseille and Agadez, direct flight, bringing tourists. Now, of course, no tourists are there to go in, that, in this, in this place, you can imagine. And they said, I was driving tourists. No tourists, I'm driving what they put on my back. Drugs, arms, and unfortunately, also migrants, illegal, illegal migrants. 
Although the word illegal is a bit complicated to us, but uh, let's, let's put my, uh, migrants. And if uh, the EU di didn't tackle this problem, I'm sure we will have many questions about, about La Valeta and about the trust fund, uh, is something that we had really to, really, really to, fi to, fi to fight against, uh, because uh, the origin, and I was saying that during the lunch actually, uh, I think the origin of the trust fund was only to finance the regional action plan. But it came at a moment when we saw in the television these horrible images of young boys died in the beach or drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. And then they decided that this fund, which was to finance with little money, to finance uh, with, with less money than now, uh, finance the regional action plan, will be really towards migration. And we created this fund with mainly Two, two wheel or, or two elements to try to approve very quickly the programs, the project, and this project must have an immediate impact on the population. This was the trust fund, which now um, almost uh, it was 1.5 billion, and um, almost all the all the money has been has been spent on the on the trust fund. But let's see what happens in the new commission. Probably will be, I hope so, it will be maybe refunded. And the last. And the last one, as I said, the border control and the fight against traffic. This is the regional action plan, which come to an end in 2020. We'll have to negotiate a new regional action plan. The advantage of the regional action plan is also that it contains not only what the EU is doing in the, doing in the region, but also what other, what member states are doing in the region. And it gives you a good uh, picture of everything which is done in the, in the region. Then. Uh, you say, well, it's very well to have a strategy, to have a regional action plan, and well, but how do you do that? And then, yes, the EU has two kinds of instruments, what I call institutional instrument and financial one. Institutional instruments, in my office, my own office, is one institutional instrument to put in order the regional action plan, actually is taking my mandate uh, to, to uh, uh, implement the, the regional action plan, the EU delegations, which are on the ground, and also, on a wider scope, our CSDP mission, our common policy and security and, and uh, security and defense um, um, uh, missions on the, on, the, on, on the ground. We have in the region three main missions. One, for the training and council of, of, the, mili of the military in Mali, of the military army, they have already trained more seven than more than 70 percent of the old Malian forces, which is really uh, really important. I was talking during the lunch. Also, the big problem is the follow-up. That's quite difficult, but they're doing really an incredible job. And we have on the civil side for the training of judges, training of in human rights, in question of gender, question of terrorism, uh, all question on the civil side, security and police, we have what we call a cap, and we have two in the region, one in Mali and one in Niger, and one in, in Niger. You cap Mali and you cap Niger. Nowadays, the EU is proceeding at what we call the regionalization of these missions. As we have seen that the terrorists have regionalized because they unite from Boko Haram to, the, to Acme, to Al Morabitun, or, or, or to now um, Al Ansur al Islam, the new one which has happened, or uh, and all and all the all the all the organization that uh, terrorist organization on the ground. We have tried to try to regionalize our mission, and there is a process which is taking place today in the EU, in order to have to be to be to, to make that these missions can train not only the Malian armed forces, but also the Malian of the G5. It's a process, uh, we are working in it, and I think it's in good, in good way, but member states have to give their agreement uh, to all what we're doing, and uh, there are some reticences also, not only from member states, but also from some countries like Mali that say, no, UTM was created for me, it wasn't created for the others. Then we have to change the mandate, which is not easy in the EU procedure, but we are working at that, and that's, from my point of view, is the only, is the only solution. Then we have, as I said, as institution, my office, the EU delegation, and the, CS, and, the CSDP, and the CSDP missions. We have the instrument institutional, but we have also, we need money. 
because without money, of course, we cannot do that. We have the financial, the financial uh, means. Of course, you know that in the region, the EU through uh, the uh, th participate more or less with 3.5 billion euros in the region, and we, if we add up everything which is given by member states individually, will reach maybe up the quantity of 8 billion. I know that one of the first questions you will ask me, with all this money, how come that the situation is degrading? And I can answer before you ask me. Well, if we weren't doing that, probably it would even go worse. But yes, you're right. We must find ways, and we are working at that, ways and means in order to make that this help or this contribution is made more properly and, more, and, 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 and better. Then we have, as, as, fund the, as I said, the, uh, the European Development Fund, uh, the 11th one with 2,500 billion, uh, 2,500 billion, 2.5 billion, excuse me, <laughs> 2,500 billion would be a bit too much, <laughs> 2,500 2, uh, million uh, for the five countries uh, in what we call in these horrible acronyms that we invent, the RIP and the NIP, the National Indicative Program and the Regional Indicative Programs, and for the region, 1,100. These make 3.5, as I, as I said. We have in second hand the trust fund that I talked that I talked uh, before, before uh, with uh, 1.8 for the region, 1.5 billion for the for the region, and we have a new, another instrument that is the African Peace Facility, because you know that the EU has a lot of difficulties uh, as far as security and defense is concerned. The treaties uh, stop us from making many actions. Uh, then we created you know, some time ago a special fund, the European Development, the European, uh, the APF, the African Peace Facility, sorry, uh, which helped to, con to, to contribute through organizations like the AU for the peace and security in the, in the region. And this is what has been used with 100, with 100 million uh, so far and 138 million, which will come Hopefully uh, next next year for the joint force of the for the joint force of the of the G, of the G, of the G5. Then the EU, as I said, has asked as taking its action mainly in these two sectors, in the security in the security one, the joint force. Mogherini, as I said at the beginning, announced immediately the 50 million. 50 million have been added. We convene a conference in Brussels. In January, in January, yes, January 2000, 2018, uh, and a sum of all the donors and a sum of more than 400 millions were uh, were disposable for the joint forces. The problem that uh, sometimes is difficult to know exactly how this quantity is spent because some countries said we give that in training. It's difficult to say how much is the training, uh, what they want, and what they need is equipment, with no doubt. But we are limited in the class of equipment we can, we can give. And also, on the development side, we, uh, the, I told you they wanted a, uh, what they call the Marshall Plan. Ten minutes. Uh, ah. No, no, if you can finish up, then we can have it. Uh, I, can, I have to finish up now. Yes, we've done Okay, <laughs> okay, then, then it's, uh, very quickly, I finish in two, min uh, finish in two, in two minutes. Then we have, uh, in, in the, well, then we have in the development side, we help them to have their famous Marshall Plan, which have been reduced to a, pro, to a program, a priority investment program, uh, that we are helping through an organization which is called l'Alliance Sahel, uh, which has been created by France and Germany, and uh, France and Germany with the participation of the, of the EU, the UNDP, the, the World Bank, and the African Bank of Development. Uh, this uh, Alliance Sahel, which has channeled really some project which have a direct impact on the situation and on, and on, the, and on the ground. Now we have new initiatives. Uh, we, have, we have initiatives, for instance, uh, within the EU, a very strong partnership which is being established between the EU and the, G, and the G5, which has started by Federica Mogherini, and I know that it's going to be uh, prolonged by, uh, by, um, by, um, by uh, Minister Borrell when he will come into office. Uh, this, 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 strategy, this, um, this strategic partnership uh, will be definitely described in February next year with all the elements on security and development. There is a new 
French, uh, French and German initiative in the framework of the G5 called the P3S, another acronym, uh, the Partnership for the Sahel on Security and Stability, uh, which the EU supports, supports very strongly, and now we are working in, into this problem. Then, finally, to finish with, then, as I see that the time is coming to an end, some challenge and some ideas on how to go on for the, for the, for the, for the future. There is no doubt that security, development, the political uh, aspect are something that we have to fulfill. But which principle must we apply to that? And I see fundamentally two, coordination and ownership. These are the two elements, and a third one, urgency, but urgency is obvious after all that I said, and I was the situation stand by today. Coordination, yes, we need a coordination. You have seen lots of initiatives from ourselves, from, the, from uh, France, from even the Americans have their own initiative. We started with the first strategy. Today, there are 17 strategies in the Sahel. Then there is a big problem of coordination. And what is the way of co to coordinate them? There are institutions, there is the, plan, the ministerial platform for the strategy in the Sahel, which has a difficulty to coordinate. Uh, the EU and myself, with my, with my team, we organize uh, once or twice a year uh, coordination activities amongst the main actors, among, among the special envoys in the, in, the, in, the, in the Sahel. But the big need is a good coordination, and that's one of the big challenges, one of the first big challenges that, 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 that we have to face. And the second one is ownership. We will never succeed if there is not a perception of this country that they own their own destiny and that everything which is done is because that's what they need and not the, because we need it. Which is difficult because I said at the beginning, their security is our security. But the big challenge that we have, and that's why it's so important to have this interlocution or these talks with them, really to know what they need and ourselves to adapt ourselves to, to their situation. They need the presence of the state because one of the main problems is the lack of the presence of the state in this country. I will say this sentence also, that the vacuum of the state is the oxygen of the terrorism. Yes, they need that. But if we give them the means, it means that they need, not the one that we think they need. Or at least that they perceive that like that, as well in the security sector or in the development sector, in the same, in the same, in the same way. And in this part, in, that's why the EU maintained this structural partnership. Because, and I will finish with that, with this sentence of uh, Federica Mogherini, which is the idea of ownership, that we are not working for Africa and for the Sahel, no. We are working, or we must work, with Africa and with the Sahel. Thank you very much for your attention.